All right, good evening, everybody. We're meeting with Todd Simon, and Todd is in Omaha, Nebraska. And, you know, I don't know, Todd and I have known each other a while, but I, I don't think we know each other as well as I would like. Let me ask you some questions. Did you grow up in Nebraska? I did. I'm a fifth generation Nebraska. Is there anybody who's, oh, never mind. Um, that's, that's amazing. Um, and were you interested in art when you were a little guy, a tyke, or how did, when did this art interest happen? Um, when I was a kid, my mother was from New Jersey. And when I was a kid, my grandparents got a house on the Jersey Shore every summer. And so um, uh, when I was five, I remember taking a trip from the Jersey Shore into Manhattan with my parents. And, you know, we went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Museum of Modern Art when I was five. And so that I think that started my interest. And then, you know, we always went to exhibitions at the local art museum, the Joplin Art Museum in Omaha. And, uh, and that's what got me interested in it. Well, it certainly accelerated at some point. Tell me what happened. Um, I got out of college in 1986. <clears throat> I was meeting my mother for dinner in Omaha. And I wandered into this place called the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts, which it turned out was being run by an old friend of the family, Ree Shonlau, who, of course, you know very well. Exactly. And in fact, she's probably the one who introduced you. I think and, so. Um, and a, 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 a guy who later became a very close friend of mine, Terry Rosenberg, was actually hanging a show in the gallery at that time. So that was the first time I met him. And it just all sort of, you know, Ree's like, you're back in town. You should get involved. And one thing led to another, and here I am. What about your involvement particularly resonates for you? I mean, some of it's, you know, the, the business aspect, but some of it's also the collecting aspect. Can we divide those two? Let's talk about, well, let's talk about each. Pick whichever you want. What, why are you so engaged? Well, when you say the business aspect, what do you mean? Exactly? Well, I mean, you know, you're involved with United States artists. You're involved, you're, you're on the board, you're president of the board of the Bemis Foundation currently. I'm not president, but I have been. Oh, okay, so I, I get that. Um, so that's really, to me, that's more like sort of like the, the, the governance community service part of the, of the art world. And, you know, that interests me just because I think that's one of the things where I can excel. I mean, I guess I'm sort of a closet artist, but I, you know, I spend my, my days, you know, running my business, Omaha State. And so I don't really, I can't really, you know, make art, but I can, but I can facilitate the process by being involved in organizations that, that are very friendly to artists. And I think over the years, what I've really found to, to love are artists. And, and really the, um, you know, sort of the, the sacrifice that they've made and the choice that they've made to become an artist. I mean, nobody in their right mind, um, you know, would become an artist. Um, that's not exactly true, but I mean, I just think, it's, I think it's a very heroic choice. I've always thought it was a great choice, one that I wasn't able to make, one that I'd like to facilitate. Yeah, the corollary is everybody should become an artist. But, that's you know. exactly right. <laughs> so I, and, I view, and I view my ability to express my creativity in other ways, more, you know, more marketing and related to my business. But, but you know, I still, I still have a, a real soft spot for the, for sort of the pure exp experimentation. Got it. And so initially it was the Bemis Foundation that you enjoyed being a part of. Uh, yeah, that was my first, that was sort of my first, uh, first stint. And I guess I've, I've never gotten onto a board of directors where I haven't been uh, wanting to be, you know, kind of a leader in the organization. I think it's not really worth my time to just kind of sit around in a room. So, you know, I've always been asking the question, how do we move the organization forward? And what's our unique selling proposition? And um, and what can we do better than anybody else does? Okay. And, and so, so those are the things that um, those are the things that really drive me when I become part of the organization. So. All right, now let's go to the collecting aspect, and then we'll come back and segue again from Venus. Um, you you collect art. I do. Is this a, a decision that's so you know the choice of artwork? Is this something that's solely yours? Is it does your wife have a say in it? Is there a veto power? How does it work? <laughs> how does it work in your household? Um, my wife um, has a has a great eye, and uh, she doesn't. She oftentimes lets me take the lead, but often, but then she'll kind of when we, if we're like at an art fair or something, she'll sort of lead me down a back alley and um, and and show me something and just say you know this really got me. And oftentimes I would say that 
I would say that almost every time she's brought something to our attention, it's something that we've ended up with, um, except if it was like a Rauschenberg or a Rosco, because we haven't gotten there yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But, but I hope um, <laughs> And where are the places you most often buy art? Not necessarily um, towns and venues, you know, galleries, art fairs, artist studios. Um, I would say artist studios and mostly the artists. I think the, a vast majority of the art that I've purchased over the years, I've purchased through artists that I've met while they were in residence at Bemis. For those of your um, viewers who don't know who uh, or what the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts is, it's the, the urban artist and residency program in Omaha, Nebraska that's been around for 35 years. And every year we bring about 50 to 60 artists from around the world to live and work in Omaha. And, you know, they're typically artists that are early in their career or artists that can take, you know, 90 days off to do something. And so I get a chance to meet, you know, over the years. It used to be I used to meet every artist. You know, now it's probably about a third to a half of them that I get to meet or the studio and see their work in process. And that gets me more engaged in the work is the fact that I actually know the artist. So a painting hanging on a wall today is less interesting to me than a painting hanging on a wall where I know the story and I've had a chance to talk to the artist and I understand, really understand what's going on. I think that's frequently true. And I want to comment to, to all you guys that Todd has spoken about Lee Schoenlau and we married Jun Kaneko and now uses his last name, Lee Kaneko, K-A-N-E-K-O. And we did a wonderful webinar with Lee, I'm thinking it was about a year ago right now, where she talked about various residency programs because there's a residency um, board and in international organizations. So she talked about international residencies and American residencies, re, R-E-E, -E, and echo, and I encourage you to listen to that. I mean, I think technically we is no longer, you know, titularly involved with the, the Bemis Foundation. She's not part of the board anymore. She's not the director. Is she on the board? She is on the board. Okay, she, um, she's not the director. She, I used yeah, to be on the board the decades ago. Right. Um, it's a hell of an organization, and they've done a, a remarkable job, and they are significantly important to the city of Omaha. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, where do you want to go with this, Todd? Do you want to talk about what, – what do you want to cover next? What do you want to talk well, about? Well, you tell me. I mean, one of the things I, you know, that I've gotten – that I've become a bit of an expert on uh, recently is crowdfunding. So I could talk about that for a second. Um, All right, and then let's use that as a way to talk about United States artists because I think – I don't think most people know what the group is or does, and you can even go from that into crowdfunding or crowdfunding into it. I'll, okay. you, you take it away. Well, I'll start, I'll start with United States Artists. Um, United States Artists, um, and you can find their website. It's um, United I'll States Artists. I'll pull it up while you're talking, and then we yeah. can, we'll take a look at it. Okay. UnitedStatesArtists.org um, is, is, a, is a, um, an organization that um, grants fellowships to America's finest living artists in all disciplines. So through last year, uh, we've, done, we've uh, given uh, $350,000 $50, fellowships to America's finest living artists in all disciplines. And not just visual arts, but also dance and music and media arts and, and uh, literature and, uh, and a few other things. And um, uh, it, it, the process is, is a lot like, um, has been a lot like the, um, the MacArthur Genius Grant, only on a, on a kind of a um, more scale in terms of numbers and smaller scale in terms of the size of the award, where a group of anonymous nominators from around the country um, has submitted uh, names for consideration, and then um, and, and, and then panels of experts consider those uh, artists, and um, and every year um, select um, 50 finalists that who get the grant. So um, it was based on the idea of an urban institute study done in one of the early 2000s about the support systems for artists, and the basic idea was that um, you know there aren't that many, and that artists um, that many artists really need a boost. And so an organization came together. It was led by the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, and the Prudential Foundation, and the Rasmussen Foundation in Alaska. A group of arts leaders came together, the foundation leaders came together and said, we want to do something significant. They seeded the organization with about $20 million in seed capital over the next few years, and then they started doing these fellowships. Um, there's no, um, 
there's no, uh, this is not a fellowship that you can apply for. It's really one that you are recognized for typically in mid, mid-career, although there have been some artists that have gotten in very early career and some artists that have gotten in late career. I want to ask you some questions about it, Paul. Were you seminal? Were you involved at the get-go? Um, I came in. I, I was. I was on the. The. I joined the board of directors about eight months in the organization. But as you know, I'm not really. You know, the, the leading board of directors I and mean, the leading. The founders were like Susan Beresford, who at the time was the CEO of the Ford Foundation. So I was in. Um, I was in very uh, auspicious company. I was like the junior member. Do these various, how altruistic are these foundations in their giving to United States artists? Is there ever any tra kind of control? I mean, I heard you say, and I don't know that I want to use Alaska as an example, but, mm -hmm. is there, but would somebody say, hey, you're not doing enough for Alaska, please do more? And we don't have to say Alaska per se, we could throw in Wyoming instead. Um, um. No, oh, the, fa the foundations have been very agnostic relative to geography, but the United States artists has been very intentional relative to geography. And I'll have to tell you that it's that's one of the things that's happened over the years is that we've been we've said to ourselves, hey, wait a minute, you know, obviously, I mean, many artists, particularly in certain disciplines, are clustered in, on the coasts, and so it really takes effort to find the right nominators to select. Um, nominees in all of the other states. So um, one of the things that's happened in the process over the years is that um, as we've looked at balancing the artists, because the goal is to have artists really represented across the country, um, is to encourage nominations from states that are underrepresented. And by doing that, um, those nominations then get fed into the exact same process. They don't get any preference in terms of in terms of ultimate selection, but we might want to select additional art um, from particular states or areas. And we've also done the same thing with disciplines. Like for instance, we found that blues music at one point was very, you know, while it's an indigenous form of American music, was very underrepresented in the um, in the genres. So we've done some work around both genre and and around geography. How many nominators are there? Um, typically, in each year, about a hundred, at least two from each state. And uh, so it's done. This is interesting. I mean, this is like how the Congress, to an extent, <laughs> is, is is divided. So right. that what that tends to mean then is, I mean, numerically speaking, there are probably more artists in New York and Los Angeles than there are in the rest of the country, or close. Nah, yeah. there's probably still more in the rest of the country. But regardless, you know, we understand the equation that I'm begging. Um, so that means that there's more, are there more grants that go to artists from Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota than there are grants that go to New York City? No, because what we found is that nominators, even when they're, even when they're a, a nominator from North Dakota, oftentimes will nominate someone from New York City or Los Angeles. Um, and so, and so, you know, one of the, one of the criteria that we, you know, we learned along the way but for instance, one of the criteria we asked our uh, nominators at one point was, we said, um, if you nominate someone from your state, then you can nominate someone else. So okay. sometimes, you know, so we would, we, we played around with different schemes uh, in an effort to draw quality n nominations from all, of, from, from all geographies. And if you look on the website, um, it does list the fellows by, by, you know, year and location. You'll see that there is very good geographic distribution. But I think there's still a couple states that aren't uh, represented. Okay. Um, and, and the nominators tend to be cross media. Um. No, yes and no. I mean, again, that we encourage nominators to nominate in their field. So you know, we may pick. You know, the nominators are typically you know they're not they're not gallerists, but they might be media directors. Um. Uh, they are, uh, we also allow the artists who are the, the, the fellows from the previous year each to submit a nomination. So there's, we try to get a, a, you know, kind of a rich gene pool. Um, uh, I'll have to tell you that um, if anybody's ever been involved in fellowship programs, these are big, these are big questions in the whole fellowship deal. Uh, how to make sure that you get a diverse group, um, how, you know, particularly when you're looking for a new program. And so, you know, it's not as easy as it seems. 
All right, so well, you've got 50 nominators. So you get 250, 300 people nominated a year. Is that about right or more? Yeah, yeah, typically between 300 and 350, actually. Out of which 50 are chosen, or is that is that number constant? Correct, 50. That's what it, that's how it has been. Right now, the organization is rethinking its um its process a little bit, and so I think it may change going forward. But that's where where it's been for the last seven. Years. And how, all right, so now these are, you've got 300 plus artists nominated. How, how, how do we whittle it down to 50? How are they, how does the selection process proceed? So there's, um, there's seven disciplines and each discipline, a, a professional panel is convened and paid to look at all of the, uh, entrants and narrow it down to a short list within their, within their, uh, discipline. What we try to do is distribute the, Fellowships, roughly, the fellowships have been distributed in proportion to the um, number of fellowships received in each discipline. So, if 10% of all the fellowships were in visual arts, then, or excuse me, 10% of all the, of all the um, submissions were in uh, visual arts, about 10% of the fellow, fellowships would be um, also in visual arts. And th that kind of goes up and down, but it's a, that's yeah. about the case. Do you pay attention to what other granting organizations are doing to make sure that you do or don't duplicate? And do you try intentionally to maintain your own distinction from other entities? Um, that's a good question. Um, one of the primary uh, things that the panelists have been asked to consider is impact of this fellowship, both on the artist and on the field. Um, and impact is a is a purposely undefined word, so that um, uh, sometimes impact could mean, you know, literally financial impact or lifestyle impact, and sometimes it could mean, you know, artistic, creative, or or other impact. So, you know, um, so typically, although not not universally, um, <clears throat> artists that have received an awful lot of other honors and fellowships probably won't get this one, but that's not necessarily true. <laughs> so it, it it really it really depends. Okay. We have uh, really we've had, we've had we've had pretty broad acceptance of our group of fellows. We haven't had you know um uh, criticism over the years of the fellowship process being sort of um, um, uh, yielding a group that you know has been too um, already too celebrated. Do you, if you guys have questions, go ahead and raise your hand because, you know, we'll jump around from topic to topic, but we'll move around a bit. Um, do you pay attention to um, racial, ethnicity, other kinds of demographics, male, female, and try and stick within some kind of guidelines? We don't have any formal guidelines except to say that we're, our, our, our mission has always been to be extremely diverse and inclusive. So we're mindful of of you know the the sex balance, we're mindful of the race balance, we're mindful of um, artists in, artists that have um, uh, like I said that are working in different different media. So we, we we're we're mindful of it and we try to tweak the process going into next year to try to balance it. But we don't go in there with a, a strict quota. We've got to have this, that, or that. Do you do you do things for what do you call the recipients? Is there a title? Fellows, USA Fellows. All right. Do you do something for the fellows besides give them fifty thousand uh, dollars? We have had a celebration, uh, and this is actually a good segue into USC project. So I'll move on to that in just a second. Uh, okay. we've, uh, we've had a celebration where we've brought all the fellows together. We've sort of vetted them. We've had a, we've had a um, we've had a chance for them to get together and network with each other. And I think that's one of the things that we've heard from the fellows over the year that years that one of the great benefits um, is the actual getting together with the other 49 um, fellows and really exchanging ideas, learning from each other. So we provide a lot of time, social time, for them to engage with each other. Okay, cool. I work with some other organizations. I'll talk to you about this offline further sometime. Okay. Um, all right, do you want to segue or do you want to take a question or two? There's two questions. Uh, yeah, sure, I'll take a question. All right, Herb, take, go ahead. Wait a minute, where did Herb go? I took the wrong button. Um, go ahead, Herb. Hey, am I on? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, Todd, 
uh, is it possible for an artist to, without expecting any response or whatever, to submit work to the nominators for them to become aware of of uh, who you are and what your work is like? No, and not in, not for this particular fellowship program. And I think that you know there, there are differences. Um, you know, among fellowship programs. So there are lots of fellowship programs out there and other kinds of art awards where artists, you know, where it's an open submission. This particular one is not an open submission. It's one where, where we're asking um, nominators to submit. So it's, and it's supposed to be a, a, fairly, a fairly anonymous process until it gets to the very end. Now, I'm not arguing whether that's the right or wrong thing to do, but that's how this organization has been designed since the beginning. But like I said, we're also doing the process of doing some rethinking right now because, you know, time change. Thanks, Herb. Um, Pam. Go ahead, Pam. Oh, hi, Todd. Thank you. Hi, Pam. Um, so I have this idea in my head now that these nominators, that this has become, that this might become like a competitive pursuit for them and... I'm wondering if like that plays a part in it at all, and if they're able to like lobby for their nominees, um, or if they just nominate and then somebody else completely takes over from there. Yeah, that's it's pretty much um, it's pretty much the latter. Um, they nominate. Okay. It's not the same group of nominators year after year either. Um, but they mm -hmm. nominate, they submit the names, and then the organization takes from there. They we invest, we then invite the artist to apply. And uh, once the artist has uh, applied, um, and, and most of them do, it's funny, the first, the first um, year or two, an artist got an invitation to apply, and we actually sort of had to call them up and say, you know, you're invited to apply for a $50,000 fellowship, and they're like, huh, who are you? And then, you know, a little bit, you know, now after seven years, artists, you know, when they get it, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I've heard about that. So, um, you know, but it's, it's basically the nominators apply. And then there was a thing initially where, at the very beginning, we didn't really tell the um, artists who nominated them. And then we sort of relaxed that towards the end and we actually sort of opened that up. But again, not until the very end of the process after the fellows, fellowships were already awarded. Okay, thanks. That's interesting. Um, next question is from Ed, who happens to be in the Omaha Stakes collection, I hear. Go ahead, Ed. Are you still collecting for Omaha Stakes? <laughs> um, it comes to mind years ago. I don't know if it was you or Fred. I guess Fred, your brother. I, I've never understood who's who. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand your question. Who's Ted? Fred. 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 Fred's my Fred. dad. Fred. Sorry. Fred's my dad. Got that, Ed? Fred's his father. Oh, okay. Oh, your father. Okay. Well, one of you bought one of my sculptures years ago. Oh, excellent. Where, uh, where, are you, where are you based? It's out in the. It's out in your. Uh, it's out there in the field called uh, uh, a rather large, rather important animal. I love that piece. That is in the courtyard in our yeah, offices. We built, in the courtyard. Yeah, we built two. Um, we've got two office buildings. They're both sixty thousand square feet, and they're connected by a connector hallway. And between that connector hallway and going to the north, there's this area of sort of limestone rock that's placed there for our for our staff and, and team members to hang out in when it's not ninety five degree Omaha weather. And um and your piece is right there. And it's, it's a great, great. Yeah, I uh I just had somebody photograph it for me. I for years I had no good photographs of that piece and uh I finally hired somebody out there in Omaha and they did a nice job. So uh anyway it was nice to see. I think I've heard a lot about your collection over the years. Well, it's nice to meet you over over WebEx. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, All right. Is. Thank you both. It's a small world. Ed, go check your mailbox tonight and see if there's a check for fifty thousand. Yeah. Um, all right, Todd. You wanted to set you a transition move from here to. Yeah, well, um, let's talk about crowdfunding a little bit. So, United States artists did ask the question: What else can we do for artists besides sort of, you know? Anonymously rooting out 50, 50 um, uh, fellows, fellowship awardees every year, and how do we provide a sort of a more day-to-day -day, um, uh, support mechanism? And so we started. We conceptualized. This is back at the very beginning, this is before any of the crowdfunding sites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo were even in play. And we said maybe we should start a crowdfunding site. 
And so we actually developed from scratch um, a crowdfunding platform specifically for artists. And there's actually a qualification process. It's, this is not about the, um, so we have this crowdfunding site. It's called usaproject.org. And, um, and so far, uh, USA Project has put over $4 million into artists' hands uh, from donors to artists. Um, we've, we've played around with the model over the years. Um, we've recently, um, we've recently made some, uh, you, are you bringing up the website? Sorry, you're distracting me. Um, we've, re we've recently um, uh, uh, made some management technology changes that are really, have really going to improve the site. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's really cool. And, I, and, and in the course of all the work that we've done on USA projects, um, we've had, a, I've had a chance to do a lot of work and try to understand other crowdfunding sites as well. Um, one of the unique features of USA Projects is that USA Projects is in and of itself a not-for-profit. And so any donations made to USA Projects that, that are re-granted to artists to support their projects are tax-deductible to the donor. Now, my disclaimer is, you know, consult your tax advisor. But basically, that's, what, that's what's happening is USA Projects are making a donation to USA Projects, and then USA Projects is in turn re-granting that money directly to artists. The project. So um, as a result, um, it's a little bit more egalitarian than a for-profit model. The other thing that's interesting about USA Project is that um, it's uh, um, that it's essentially right now it's free for artists, meaning that we we um, we fund the operation by asking the donors to make a donation to USA Project as part of the donation process. But unlike other crowdfunding sites, we don't charge a flat fee off the top to artists. Uh, and that's, that's been a change in the model over the last year. And it's, it's really been, it's really been a, um, it, 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 the great thing about USA Projects is you're in the company of other artists that really care about the artists and producing art. Um, it's not just, you know, there are, and I don't want to, roll my eyes at this, but there are plenty of crowdfunding sites that, that um, for instance, you know, my kid wants to take violin lessons, I'm trying to raise $500 to buy a violin. That's a, that's a legitimate use of crowdfunding, but it, it's not an artistic use of crowdfunding this way that we define it. Are these, are these submissions vetted? Are they screened or juried? Is there some procedure? I mean, does anybody who apply get in? How does it work? Um, you, there's a very simple qualification process. It's basically open to, you know, a professional artists and art students and art faculty. Anybody who's sort of making a living or, or wanting to make a living um, from being an artist. Um, there is a, um, an approval process where the project, is, where the artist, where the, the qualifications of the participant are initially approved. Um, it doesn't slow you down very much. And then there's, um, and then there is a process, sort of an ongoing process where projects are reviewed, and if they don't meet the terms of use, for instance, if there's some content that's particularly objectionable, I think we all know what that means, um, um, then, then there might be a chance that a project might be shut down. But it's, I don't think, I, I can't remember it happening more than once or twice over thousands of projects that have been funded so far. So. Um. I don't have any idea the, the, the statistics for Kickstarter or the United, United States Artist Projects. What percentage of art projects on Kickstarter get funded? What percentage of your projects get funded? Uh, that's a great question, Paul. Um, are the, the typical funding percentage for most of the mass um, uh, crowdfunding sites is about 45%. Now, it depends because some of the sites, like some of the sites, don't have an all or nothing model. We're currently operating on an all or nothing model, but I think that's one of the things that's going to be that's going to be um, put into question because I don't think that that necessarily has to be. Um, but Kickstarter and United States Artists operate on an all or nothing model. Indiegogo operates on an all or nothing model or a whatever you you get whatever you raise model. And there's a couple other there's a couple other sites that operate under that model as well. But on the all or nothing models. Um, my the latest statistic I had for Kickstarter was about 45% of the projects get funded, and on um, United States Artists it's been about 73%. Now, what's really this is really apropos though of the um, of your last 
uh, lecturer, um, Katie, talking about social media because the the number one factor that affects the ability of a project to get funded is the social network and personal network of the artist um, yourself. So if you have a good email file, if you've got a good social media presence, if you have a sense of marketing and self-promotion, um, you will be much more likely to get funded than someone who doesn't because the people do not shop for art projects the way they shop for a pair of socks. People, most people do not hit this front page that Paul brought up. Most people don't think, oh, I'm going to fund an art project. I think I'll go to Kickstarter. I think I'll go to um, United States or USA Projects and, you know, find one to fund. Most people are reacting to, to the reach out of either the artist or a friend or family member who has, who has, who has already contributed to the project or is, or is spreading the link about the project. So um, that's really the most powerful thing. When people get a link, they go right into the project page. Very, very few people actually hit the home page unless you're coming there to start a project in the first place. Can you tell any difference between what kind of projects people submit to you and Indiegogo and Kickstarter for visual artists? Um, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at the, um, at, you know, drilling down into the actual quality project. And quite honestly, I'm not sure that I'm necessarily um, qualified to do that. Um, All right, well, then let me ask you, what kinds of projects do visual artists tend to submit to you? Um, well, typically projects that are going to, a lot of the projects I've seen are projects that are going to require some, um, some level of expenditure to realize outside of their normal practice. So, for instance, I'm a photographer and, um, you know, I, I want to go to Alaska to photograph, you know, uh, Eskimo boats. Um, you know, that, the, the act of, of getting to Alaska has been the hurdle, not the capability of the photographer at that moment. Um, and so those kinds of things are, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a poet and I'm, uh, you know, I want to go to a certain part of the country or I want to go on a retreat or, you know, there's different kinds of, uh, of, of, um, of things, but typically there are things that are going to involve some sort of expenditure that's out of the norm. If you guys have questions, go ahead and raise your hand. <clears throat> what are you are you supporting some of these efforts? I mean, are you voting, bidding? What's the right? Uh, yes, I have supported a number of projects, um, and one of the things that I've also um, that I've done is provided a help provide a matching fund. So one of the other features within uh, USA Projects is from time to time a particular donor um, and might come in and say, I want to provide matching funds to artists that are working either in a particular discipline or a particular geography. We've had, for instance, a community foundation in California say, well, what our mission is to provide funds for California. So filmmakers, oh, wait, here's a great example. The Austin Film Society put up a matching fund for filmmakers in Texas. And said, if you're, a, if you're a filmmaker in Texas, we will match your project dollar for dollar up to $10,000. And they put up a $60,000 matching fund. So that gives us a way to then help, help distribute funds on behalf of a foundation or an individual, which is kind of a novel way to do it because, like, I have my own private foundation as well. And for us to, like, to vet projects is extremely difficult because it's just me and my wife. So we don't really... You know, but but if an, but an organization like United, USA Projects can sort of have it has its own vetting mechanism. So if we say we want to fund sculptors working in you know Nebraska, um, you know that's something that we could do. Put out the call; those projects would show up here, and then we would contribute to funding their projects doing that. And to an extent, United States Projects works as a fiscal agent and doesn't take a percentage. Correct. That's what the model is today. Although. Um, we specifically disclaim fiscal agency. That's not exactly what we do. We're actually a granting organization. Right. I mean, I, I can just, I, I get the, the difference and the significance. But yeah, that's nice. And there's a lot of responsibilities that go with fiscal agency that's, that don't come with just granting. And so that's, so there's a legal dis distinction between the two. But from a practical perspective, they operate very similar. 
So what kinds of, how much time do you spend a day on art? Um, well, uh, I, you know, this kind of, this is a good segue back into the collecting discussion, which I, because I brought up my, um, I brought up my list of, um, of, uh, of artists in my collection a few minutes ago, and I was, which is not completely up to date. So I have a six-year-old child and a three-year-old child. So my, um, my art fair wings got clipped. I think the last art fair I went to was, was the freeze fair in 2007. No, I went to the Chicago, the new Chicago Expo last year. But, um, but so I'm about seven years or six years behind on art fairs. And, um, uh, but I was, I was reflecting on this before the, before the call today. And, you know, some people, what drives them, and I think what drove me for a while when I was going to all these art fairs was I didn't want to miss out. You know, I didn't want to miss out on whatever was happening right now. And then at some point I realized that what's happening right now is always happening right now. Um, <laughs> you know, that now is this moving target. So I feel like I feel like as soon as I get, like when I decide to get back into collecting, I've been, you know, I, I mean, I'm still collecting, but I haven't been collecting in the same way. Um, uh, with next time I go to art fair, I'll just plug into what's happening now, and I'll be just as satisfied as I was with what's happening now five years ago or seven years ago. Does that make any sense, or does that sound silly? No, it makes total sense. Do you know Sandy Kemper? No. Sandy Kemper has an investment fund out of Kansas City that sure. invests in artwork, and they do, I'm trying to recall, and they do three things, one of which was what made me think of it. Well, one of it is they try to buy art that's got, you know, a, a, a decent investment trajectory. Two is it's mostly for people who are not sophisticated collectors, so that the buy-in, I think, is multiples of $100,000, and you get a vote, and you get to vote on what kinds of things are um, maybe acquired, but you all, more than that, you get a vote as to what kind of art you're going to get to take home. So hmm. that all the art that they buy for investment potential is distributed to the homes of the people who are part of the fund. Oh, another, cool. another thing that they do is that they use their clout at art fairs to get invited to private boats, private collections, private events, where you know the school of what's happening now is revealed. Right. Well, that's. I mean, that's really been my interest because that's what I get from my association with the Bemis Center. And a lot of ways, that's what I get from my association with the United States Artists, because I get one of the things we do is when we have our board meetings around the country, we typically get to meet members of the arts community, both visual and otherwise, um, uh, as, we, um, uh, as we move around. And I was reflecting on my own personal philosophy on art collecting. You know, it's not about, for me, it's, never, it's not about an investment. Um, I, I, I do sort of, you know, wryly, take wry pleasure in knowing that a piece of art that I bought, you know, 10 years ago actually, you know, means something to other people today. But that's not, and, and I guess financially that's interesting to me. But, uh, you know, but I have no intention of selling. I don't have, or at least in my head today, you know, uh, almost all of the art I have uh, is in my home. It's there for me and my family to enjoy. Um, and, um, and it's, you know, I'm looking around my office right now where I'm sitting, and there's a piece behind me here um, who, I think I could remember the artist if I really thought about it. Um, uh, you know, but I've got a, there's a Betty Woodman piece um, across the room, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm really happy that I bought a Betty Woodman piece when I bought a Betty Woodman piece. Um, but I didn't buy it thinking that, thinking that, you know, Betty was going to be the same as Betty is. You bought that because Betty was on the board of the Bemis a long time ago. Right, I mean, she still is, and I've had a chance to meet Betty and talk to Betty and see a lot of her work and meet her family, and and uh, I think I think Betty's great, but you know, and then ten years after I met her, she had a retrospective at the Met. <laughs> it was a nice show. Exactly. Um, so, but all right, so let's talk about some of these personalities. I mean, a lot of collectors are really committed to art and artists like you are, and some of them aren't, and. I suspect mostly the folks that you run into and those, I mean, the, the people who are part of the business, you know, the art community that you meet with and those who are nominating and those who, you know, are involved in your various art projects are much more selflessly involved in the arts, I think. Um, do those folks resonate more for you than, I mean, are there collector clubs that you particularly care about or what's your engagement with 
collective groups and groupings? No, I mean, for my, it's more social. I mean, there's people that I like who are art collectors, you know, that I trade ideas with, you know, people like Kurt, you know, yep. in, in Chicago and, and, and my friend Tim Schrager in, in, uh, in Atlanta and his father, Phil Schrager, when he was still living in Omaha. And those are the people that I kind of look to to sort of trade ideas with and discuss with and, you know, what are you interested in, you know, and like, so, you know, you know, Tim might say, hey, I found this artist in this sort of, you know, up and coming gallery in Atlanta, you know, you need to see her work, um, you know, you know, and, and it's not, and the question isn't, well, what do you think it's going to be worth someday? The question is, you know, it's, it's really cool. And maybe even it's really cool and really affordable. So you don't have to think about, you know, I mean, I, my thought process, and I think this is, um, this might be meaningful to your, to your audience, you know, my thought process changes significantly as the price goes up. So, you know, I'm willing to take a chance on a piece in the, you know, in the, I don't know, call it under $20,000 range in a way that I'm not willing to take a chance with something in the, say, over $50,000 range. So, you know, I'm really, really, you know, and so it's a lot easier for me and my wife and, and uh, for us to look at a piece of art and say, oh, we really, really love that. And then, you know, if it's, if it's, and then it becomes kind of easy to make the decision to buy it if it doesn't sort of stretch our wallet, you know. Once art starts costing more than cars or, you know, or uh, um, <laughs> I don't know what else, um, it's probably about the only thing it costs more, or houses, you know, then you start to really, you know, then you really start thinking about it. And then you need to justify it, or you need to feel like you can be whole without hurting yourself within the not too distant future. Right. I mean, there have been moments when I've seen pieces of art where I've, where I've been like, I've got to have it. Um, uh, I have a Nick Cave sculpture that I bought probably after his third show in New York. And I was just, but I've been eyeing his work. I've been seeing it. And like, I'm not, I just, you know, for, for a couple of years, I've been like, I've got to have one of those. I really, there's something about that that resonates with me. And then I finally sort of pulled the trigger. Of course, if I would have pulled the trigger when I first said, I got to have it, it would have been a whole different story. I mean, there's artists, it's funny because there are, I do have a few stories of artists that I feel like I missed out on. Um, and, you know, because I saw their work, and I liked it, and I just kind of, for some reason, I just sort of let it go by. It happens. Um, it happens. But, um, you know, I, so I, you know, those are, those are fun stories to tell. You know, just a week ago, we did a webinar with Nick Cave, and he was absolutely amazing. I'll send you a link to it so that you can watch it. He was, I would love to. He was really, I mean, my wife Amy and Nick went to school together. I've known him a long, I've known him forever. And, you know, just to see all the success coming his way is deserved and something that he has consciously worked on to get, you know, I mean, it's still about the art, but he's consciously worked on getting his art out into the world. And he's, it's, he's, it's he's such a nice beautiful. Artist. He's the, I'm sorry. Artist. he's the United States artist fellow as well. Right. No, he, yeah, and he was, he was really wonderful. Um, all right, you guys, we've covered a bunch of different things, and I can keep going, but I would rather defer to you if I saw some hands that weren't Pam or her. So who, who, else, who else wants to ask a question? Um, Omaha Steaks, do you ever think about doing something more artful with the company? Or do you do anything artful with the company? Um, we do. I mean, we have we have a corporate art collection. Um, okay. One of the one of the things that we have is kind of interesting. We have an we have a full set. It's a little bit nostalgic, but we have a full set of um, uh, E. S. Curtis uh, photo gravure prints, uh, the American Indian series. Um, it's eight hundred and some prints, and um, and they're and they're from a second strike that was done in the in the eighties. Um, after the original strikes were done in like the 20s or something, um, and uh, and the photogravure prints, were, the photogravure plates were literally lost for for 40 years, and um, and I think and then I think only 12 only 12 strikes were made, so we've got one of 12 of the second set that were ever created of these, and we tour them around the country and they visit. They've been all over the world in different sets of them, and then we have a number of we've commissioned works. Um, Works for the office. We have a big June Kaneko wall uh, in our office. We have uh, we have Ed's piece in our in our courtyard, and um, and we have a lot of local artists that we've that we've engaged with over the years. 
Do you think it's inappropriate, though, for people to know that you, as a seminal and, and major figure with Omaha Steaks, is very involved in art? Is this the kind of thing that you ever think about putting flyers in the steaks that go out or, you know, that say, buy more art? Um, or, <laughs> or, or, or do you think it's inappropriate? Um, I mean, it's just a focus thing. I guess I, if, if I have, if I have, I mean, we're, we're not shy about it from a PR perspective when, when asked, and we talk about a lot about our various, you know, as a cor as corporately, we're very involved in the community, not just the visual arts, but we sponsor operas and symphonies and those kinds of things, and we're, we're always on the marquee, and we're, you know, we talk about that. So, so I don't, we don't keep it a secret, um, but I think, it, I think from an actual marketing perspective, um, like in my, um, in my uh, packages, uh, I'd rather sell you more steaks. <laughs> okay. And uh, um, Omaha Steaks, what percentage do you think of support in the arts broadly is within the greater Omaha, Nebraska community, and what percentage is beyond that? Um, of our art support, of our philanthropy yeah. in general? Yeah. Oh, it's about, it's about, I would say, 80% in the Omaha community. And then, and then, but but many of us in the family, like myself, I'm involved in the United States Artists, um, which is a national organization. My father's been involved in a, a bunch of different opera organizations and also maintains a home in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where he's involved in the opera and the visual art there. So, you know, as, our, as, as there's been some diaspora in the family and we put down roots in other communities, we've gotten involved in other communities. Cool. All right. You guys don't have any more questions for Todd? Sri, go ahead, Sri. Hey, hi Todd. Thanks for uh, coming on. Um, I just recently signed up with uh, Fractured Atlas. I was looking at you guys too, but uh, I ended up going with them. Um, but I like your uh, your your project website as well. I was wondering also, uh, do you guys work with art advisors in um, helping to uh, grow your collection at Omaha State? And uh, that's kind of I guess that's a loose question. I don't know what. No, that's it's been a good long question. Day, sorry. Thanks, Thank first you. of all, thanks for bringing up Fractured Atlas, another great organization. Um, does a tremendous amount of work for artists. Um, they have a fiscal sponsorship uh, program. They have a work on a crowdfunding thing, and they've got a good partnership with Indiegogo. Um, um, I really like those guys, and they've done great work. Um, the um, the question about art advisors. We probably should, but we don't. But I also think that it's because we don't really have a strategy around building a corporate collection per se. Um, and but if if we did, you know, uh, Paul would be the first guy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Smart man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. And who else has got a question? Let me see. Herb, your hand is still up. Do you have another question, Herb? I'm going to take that as no. No, you're right. Oops, I'm sorry. I just hit the mute. Go ahead, Herb. No, you're you're correct. No, it's still up. <laughs> okay, cool. If you if you click on the hand button, it it, it will go back down. Um, Todd, what do you do about your kids and art and your plan? I mean, does your six year old do you drag them to galleries? Do you avoid it? Do they do they do they resist yet? What's the deal? We we take them to everything and they love it. Um, you know, we did a project where the Bema Center has been doing a project in Omaha with the Aspen Gates called um, right. Carver Bank Project. And there's been a number of like kind of impromptu events that have come up. And you know, we get an email about them a couple days beforehand. And so if we're available on a Thursday or a Friday night or Saturday night, you know, we'll take the kids down there. There's a sandwich shop there. We'll get them dinner. Um, uh, we love to have our kids uh, running around in galleries and. You know, our, I think probably the thing I say to the most is, don't touch the art, unless they can touch it, in which, we, in, case, in which case we say touch it. We also encourage them. We've, got, we've actually got an arts and crafts room in the house where they can get messy. It's got a concrete floor and sinks that are only two feet high, and, uh, and we've, got, we've always got paint and brushes and, and easels and paper, and we want them to uh, – we, we, we just – we're trying to encourage them as much as we can. I hope that – um, I hope that it actually works. We have a, we have a piano. We're teaching our six-year-old to play piano, and our three-year-old has the cutest little cello we've ever seen. So yeah, we're 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 very um, we're very hopeful that 
that they'll be into it going forward. And our daughter um, has been drawing the same image. In fact, um, we just bought a book about um, kids' art. It was, um, it was edited by um, Paul. You probably know this guy, um, Michael Feldman Einstein. Oh, I can't remember. He was the visiting scholar at the University of Nebraska last um, uh, last semester. He did a series of lectures at the Conecuh, <laughs> yep. um, and um, he wrote a book about about childhood art and. Um, and uh, our daughter, who's six years old, um, has been drawing the same image since she was about 18 months old, and sort of perfecting it. So it's kind of amazing. I mean, we can. My my wife has this fantasy. She's collected every single one of them of doing like a time lapse film where we put all of these images together from for the last for the last four and a half years and see how they've evolved over time. That's awesome. I wonder how long this is going to continue. That's really cool. <laughs> um, I've just been told that because I was sharing my desktop, people couldn't see the list to raise their hands, and now hopefully you can raise your hand. Oh, Christine, maybe you have a question. <laughs> Let me go back to the, the collecting thing for a moment. Is everything you've acquired hanging at home? Um, I would say right now about, and it's not just things that hang, um, there are things that project and things that sit on you know, shelves. Do you have um, storage? We have storage. I would say about. 70% is up. So, I mean, it's interesting to see how one defines a collector. You know, I mean, Leo Castelli defined a collector as someone who spent more time buying art than they did earning money to pay for it. <laughs> I define a collector as someone who continues to buy art after their walls are full. Mm -hmm. And I think at that point they said way from, you know, just decorating maybe. I mean, then you know, they, they, then they have this compulsion. So, is this when you buy art? Does it hang, or does it sometimes just go to straight to storage? No, I, I anything I buy, I want to put up immediately. So the first question we ask is, where will it go, and what will we displace? Um, and those two questions sort of balance that. In fact, um, we were building a house. Uh, we just moved in 18 months ago, and during the time we were building the house, we sort of put up a halt on buying art because we wanted to hang. What we had in the new house, and see where we had holes, both in both visually um, and sort of aesthetically, um, and then a little bit of you know architecturally, um, so that we could make sure that we that we uh, had good representation. So, I, and I'm ready to rehang the house. It's been almost 18 months now. I'm ready to sort of rejuggle everything. Wait a minute. Did you do that previously in your previous home? You rehung the art periodically every 18 months yeah. or something. Not every 18 months. It was more like every two years. So and you would kind of put it all down and pile it all up, and then start start anew. No, there's some. There's some. Um, I would say there's sort of some iconic pieces that, that we and our friends expect to see. But I don't know. I don't know what your what the reaction of your of your audience is. But we have pieces that we bought initially that we just loved, and that and then now that we live with them for five or ten years, we look at them and say. I'm kind of tired of that, or it doesn't doesn't hit me the same way it used to. Where I'm, you know, I'm I'm whatever it was that you know initially um, uh, spurred us to to own that, i has sort of gone away, and um, and I think it also that makes that in itself makes you reflect on what what got you to buy that. Was it some deep enduring concept or or beauty, or was it kind of faddish? And I, and I describe faddish as being kind of a personal thing. I think things that inspire you, seduce you in that moment might be your own personal fads. Like I'm always, I'm responsive to anything that's got a video screen in it, for instance. I, it catches my attention probably because I grew up in the age of Star Trek or something. And then, you know, and now, um, but now I have to say, okay, that's got a video screen. What else does it have? You know, what does it really have besides a video screen? And so, you know, there's some pieces I bought that were so cool because they have video screens, and now I just never turn them on because they bore me. I also think that, you know, good art should challenge the collector, the viewer, to, you know, to rise to its level. And once you've done that frequently, I think, you know, once the artist challenged you and the challenge you've accomplished or you've risen to that level, then it's time to move on. So, you know, and, and I think it's fine to take that art down. What do you do with the art that 
where this has happened, where you don't love it as much as you did five, ten years ago or more when you acquired it. You sell it, you donate it, you put it up at auction, do you stick it in the closet, what happens? So far it's been stick in the closet. Um, I think at some point when we run out of closet space um, or storage space, we actually have a you know relative, a gallery style storage space in the basement that's got decent climate control and all that. So, um, so at some point that's going to be full and then I guess I'm going to have to make some choices because I don't really, I'm not really inclined to, nor do I know that I could find sort of an off-premise art storage location in Omaha. So that, that'll be a challenge. Yeah, I don't know offhand either, but there's a lot of there's a lot of buildings in Omaha that could could serve that purpose. <laughs> um, unfortunately, too many. I don't see anybody else with more hands up now that I can. Christine, did you have a question? Wait, there you go, Christine. Uh, well, I was just thinking you could you could have a gallery exhibit with the work that he wants to uh, maybe have other people take off his hands. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that, that's, a, that's actually a, a good suggestion. Um, we actually, in our home, have a gallery. So um, we have about a, it's about a 1,200 square foot gallery. And, um, and, and one of my regrets is that I don't spend enough time in it. Um, uh, you know, we kind of had this idea, let's have a gallery in our home. And then, and then um, it, what's really where we spend time, which is also hung kind of like a gallery, um, is where we really spend our time. So the gallery is a separate space. I think it's kind of a neat idea, but it might have been a little bit misplaced because when you're not living among the art and you actually create a separate place for the art, it be it's it's cool, but it's not it's not very practical. Good. All right, I'm about out of questions, folks. You guys have any more? I don't see any hands. Um, I think this is really fascinating. I mean, Todd, a lot of what I want to be able to show artists, you demonstrate. And that is the kind of passion and enthusiasm, you know, you bring to this facet of your life and that it's grown, you know, from a community engaged. And I'm also, you know, I like people to support their own community and I don't think it has to be only that, you know, so that when Omaha Stakes gives the preponderance of its generosity to the Omaha community, I think that's a beautiful thing. You know, that you do something outside of that, I think that's nice. If the rest of the family is involved philanthropically in their endeavors is is wonderful. But, you know, the fact that you love art and that you're moved by it and that, you know, you're, you're compelled to acquire it and live with it and do justice to it, you know, I think as a, too many artists don't see that enough. So that I'm really thrilled and pleased with how you've demonstrated that tonight and shared, you know, I think generously what you do and how you go about doing it. Thank you. Thanks. I would, can I say one other quick thing? I know that you're, that you're sure. closed there, but um, I was just thinking, reflecting on my gallery since you were asking about it. You know, it's funny. I have some pieces that have, you know, are, I don't, they're not blue chip because I don't know any of them are, but they're, um, you know, they're, they're sort of higher end and pieces that I've acquired at the Bemis. But I've got a piece in my gallery that takes up an entire wall. It's probably 20 feet wide by 12 feet tall, and it's made out of uh, the shells of computer monitors. And I bought it uh, out of a out of a um, UNO University of Nebraska Omaha student art show from the artist who I met at the art show and really thought the piece was great and sort of made a deal with him. Hey, when will you come install this in my house? And you know, he, I think I paid seven hundred fifty dollars for this for this piece of art. I told him I'd cover installation expenses. And it's one it's, it's it's one of the most interesting pieces and one of the most prominent on pieces in my collection. And and I got it because I just thought it was so interesting um, and, and really for no other reason. And I also sort of felt like at that moment, like here's a guy asked, I, here's a guy who never sold a piece of art before. So I also have the distinction of being the first person to ever buy a piece of art from me. I suppose if he goes on to have a retrospective at the, at the Met, they'll call me up. <laughs> you can count on that part, but that's what he's doing. <laughs> you know, and I, I know I've done that a few times and, you know, it, it, it it's something that feels really good about, you know, making a difference to your community and making a difference via art. And, you know, I mean, I think that artists are our salvation in a lot of different kinds of ways. And to be able to support them so that they can do more to make our society, our planet a better place, you know, goes around, comes around. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. 
Awesome. All right. Let me unmute everybody so we can all thank you in unison. Thanks so much for being with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Recording. Don't run away yet. Hey, Ed. <laughs> <laughs>